Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Josh Hatter. It's great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I I spend a lot of time in short-term rentals and boutique hotels now. Actually, spent almost twenty years in corporate America in sales. I think my my max number of flights I took as a sales guy was ninety four in twenty nineteen. I think it was at up to like forty two or something in the first ten weeks of twenty twenty before COVID shut that down. So didn't actually quit my W two until December nineteenth of twenty twenty one. I've been kind of quietly building my short-term rental business on the side for the better part of the last decade before that. But yeah, live in Charleston, South Carolina. Been here now almost 25 years. I'm kind of dating myself a little bit. I was just looking at the calendar today to see this is my 25th anniversary coming up here. Grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, about 20 miles outside of the district. Certainly did not come from any means. Dealt with a lot of terrible stuff growing up. You know, father died in prison, things like that. It's uh, it's always important to me that, you know, as we're getting into the business side of things, just to understand where the, the start of the game was, so to speak. But yeah, so I moved to Charleston for uh, 1999 for college, just never left. Dipped my toe into short-term rentals in 2012. Um, was on the road a lot and, uh, and doing um, sales for primarily Navy contractors supporting the Department of Defense. That was really kind of right post 9-11 when I started. The regulatory environment shifted a lot the last 10 years of my career. But I spent a dozen of years of that working for Fortune 500 companies, and one of them actually split into two separate public companies and laid off 700 people. And I was one of those 700 people. So got laid off with 700 of my friends in uh, 2012. And I took, I had a little one bedroom condo on King Street, which is kind of like the place to be in downtown Charleston and put it on VRBO long before the proliferation of Airbnb and did well with it. I actually got shut down by the HOA relatively quickly. They defined short-term rental. 2012 was long before anybody really knew what an STR was, but they defined short-term rental as anything less than a year. <laughs> so obviously I wasn't wasn't meeting that threshold. I actually kind of tried a couple other businesses, failed miserably at them, um, came back to, uh, to short-term rentals in February of 2016, just running. By then I had sold that little condo and bought a single family home. And uh, I'd like to say that I've been kind of pl been playing Monopoly ever since. Uh, so I kind of went from that one uh, bedroom being rented out in February of 2016 uh, to now um, run a $10 million property management company that manages short-term rentals. We manage about $100 million of short-term rentals, 19 cities in three states. And then I also invest in boutique hotels, historic bed and breakfasts, and I'm a partner in a company that owns two of those that my management company actually manages. Nice. So you got a good bit of experience. A little bit. Um, and, and you learn the lessons of my job is safe, right? Business is <laughs> scary. <laughs> yep. The reality is in business, we have control. When you're an employee, you have no control. Yep. And I think that's why a lot of people start their business. Totally. Percent. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, as you kind of, uh, as, as you spend more time in corporate America, especially if you go through that, you realize how impermanent things are. And the crazy thing, uh, you know, you look around and everybody else's life just keeps on going, you know, completely unfazed that you have this devastating thing going on that really upends you. So yeah, it really forced me to kind of look in the mirror a bit and, you know, what did I do? What did I do that I could have done better um, here if, if there was such a thing? But also look at like personal balance sheet, you know, hey, how much am I really burning here? My lifestyle, I, I had a good salary when it happened. My lifestyle had certainly inflated to my, my salary. So it really kind of forced me to kind of cut some things back and just get headed on a very different path, which I'm fortunate to have gone through now at this point, a dozen years later. I know quite a few business owners who's turn their business into a personal piggy bank sometimes and they're taking a little too much out of the till and they wonder why they are struggling with cash flow at some point in the future. Yeah. yeah or they that's go, a... that's a business expense. Uh, yeah. Okay, it is, but that's still your money. Exactly. Well, I, I tend to believe too that illegal doesn't scale. So, you know, if it's not defensible in an audit, I'm not, I would rather not lean into trying to claim something. Um, and not only that, but you know, I want to run my business as a business. Like I, I don't, I don't, any of the businesses that I'm involved in, we're not looking to sell anything today. 
but you know, we literally just completed a valuation analysis on the property management company uh, just to really have them poke holes in what we could do better uh, from a valuation perspective because they're really looking at the guts. And so I'm always kind of looking, I'm a big EOS guy, um, you know, love profit first, right? So I, I, I love uh, leaning into those things. Anything I can systematize or add a, a process to or automate, I really try to lean into those things um, from a business perspective. So how did you learn about profit first and how has it helped you? Yeah, I, uh, I so I, I joined this mastermind called GoBundant several years ago, three or four years ago, and that's been life-changing for me. It's, it's really, a lot of the folks in it have a, a real estate background. It's got a $2 million net worth required Requirement now is a million when I joined it. Um, there's about a thousand folks in it across the U.S. and Canada. But that that uh, that exposure to extreme accountability and extreme transparency really kind of changed my life. And one of the things that comes out of a group of folks like that is you have really great book suggestions. You got a handful of readers in there, and I don't know that I've read a bad book out of out of that group that's been suggested. So that was a suggestion from one of the folks in the mastermind um, that I'm in, and it's been huge for me. I mean, just bucketizing certain expenses, right? And, and you mentioned it briefly. Owners tend to kind of take from the till, especially when you're very small, um, right? There's not exactly a, a whole lot to go around. You're trying to figure out how to balance scaling and hiring out tasks you don't want to do for the rest of your life and work on on the business instead of in the business. And being able to look at every dollar that comes in and assign a profitability number to it, and then that and tagging operating expenses to the 50% mark, um, I think is a huge thing when you really look at uh, trying to back into that profit first number. Um, and it's the whole pay, your, pay yourself first concept. It's so interesting because people, financial advisors talk about that. You know, If you do have a corporate job, uh, where you have access to a 401k and people talk about paying yourself first. Uh, but there really isn't anything like that for entrepreneurs with the exception of profit first, I think. It's been a huge thing for me and one of the many books that I've read that have caused a huge mentality shift in the way that I look at everything. You know, it's funny, and I don't know if everyone knows this. I have another podcast called Richer Soul. And on Richer Soul, we had Tim Rhodes on, who's one of the, yep. the OGs of Go Abundance. And I actually went out to Salt Lake City with uh, our mutual friend, Eric, back in 2022, I think we released eight or 10 episodes of people from Go Abundance, including um, nice. Mark Moses, who does, you know, he's, you know, kind of go big. And, uh, the gentleman who does, uh, he was the executive producer for uh, South Park, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, so Mark's... it was cool. Like, yeah. Mark I know, I know Kendall. Yeah. 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 So got to meet a lot of cool people, you know, and it's it's great to be around those, you know, that type of a crowd because you are the average of the five people. Yep. What I really like about what GoBundance does, and I actually brought it, my mastermind group was we want a scorecard. We're going to put our financials down. We're going to show how much we weigh. We're going to show what we're working on and looking at that historically. And and that's a big game changer. I call it getting naked in front of the guys, right? You yep. sit up there and go, here's what's going on. And you're allowed to poke any part of it. And it's huge. It's huge. It's huge. And, and it's not just, to your point, it's not just finances, right? You're looking at family, friends, faith, uh, fitness, yep, all even, of it. you know, charitable contribution. What are you giving back? Um, and then obviously finance and, and, and your businesses. So yeah, it's really that holistic perspective. It's been, you know, it's one of the, the core things I can point to that's had a massive impact on my life, you know, just generally, but especially in the last, you know, three, four years. And it, it's definitely big. So let's talk about your success. Cause I think you just found out right. 365 on the Inc. 5,000 list. We did. Yeah. They just announced it at noon today, um, for 2023, uh, the 2024 list, uh, based on the 2023 numbers. Uh, but yeah, we came in number 365 out of 5,000, uh, number two in the Charleston area and number three in South Carolina. Um, so something to, something to definitely be proud of. Uh, we were 741 last year. So it's our second time on the list with that business. And moving quick, right? So how are you able to grow and do that? I mean, I'm assu like, we know that the profit side, I'm assuming EOS also helped dramatically with that. Oh, too. totally. Yeah, totally. I like to, I'm a, a kind of a self-described data dork. Uh, so I've actually been collecting 
um, EOS type data. Um, I self-implemented probably four years ago. We had a, an implementer. Actually, in fact, the very first meeting I went to with GoBundance was an EOS implementer. And, you know, of course he's trying to, to sell what he's doing. And my business was nowhere near being able to support that at the time. And so I said, okay, well, what can I do to get the most out of this time? Let me read all the books associated with it. And then let me look at my entire business from this perspective and take notes of like what I think this blueprint looks like. And then let me go and be able to, and I took, you know, had my right hand person uh, do the exact same thing. And so we really went into it with a game plan of, you know, let's come out of this being able to do a piece of this ourselves. And that, I mean, probably three, four years ago. So I've been collecting that data now for a while. And then, you know, it really, I like to make decisions based on data. I don't want to do it based on my gut, right? The data doesn't mean anything if you don't make the right decisions based from it. So yeah, it's, it's been huge as well. And just in terms of being able to set up systems, right? You can't hide an EOS. We have a manager's meeting every morning and everybody briefs their area, you know, their business unit of the business. It's very obvious when somebody's not pulling their weight in EOS uh, because talk about, about extreme transparency and, and ownership, it's the same thing, right? I mean, you're talking about your business area and you're giving the metrics based on it. Everybody else can see if, if something is slipping. You know, and then we kind of all jump in there and, and figure out what we need to do to solve it. Uh, you know, I, I like to say nothing good lasts forever and nothing bad lasts forever. Um, it's okay if we make mistakes, we just try to learn from them and not make them again. And that's a big part of it. I'm a big fan of EOS. What I have found is the one thing that was always missing in EOS was a good financial dashboard. And so bringing that financial dashboard to people who love dashboards. And then the second part of it was in EOS, everyone's got a number. And what I've learned as the profit guy is whatever number you give them, they'll meet that objective. Be very careful what you incentivize. So you mentioned you're a sales guy. Here's the thing. If I incentivize my salespeople to close deals and I don't make sure that we've got rules around accounts receivable, yeah. when the sales rep gets recognized cut, cut and whatever credited, deal they want. <laughs> and how fat the GP is on the deal, yep, yep. they'll sell the deal for nothing because you told them sell. Exactly. And and that goes for every part of the company. We want to make sure we pick the right metric for every right. person, because what would really suck is if everyone in your company hit their metric and you lost money. Right. Because it means you had the wrong metrics. And, and that's and my too fault. Often, yep. Yeah, that's well, my it's fault. Your, but it's also your fault for not. The problem is you may not realize the unintended consequences. For sure, yeah of the metrics you pick. And so that's that's the part of the picture that we really bring in is knowing how to make sure that it's the good metric. Yeah. And the yeah, unintended that's, uh, consequence. I don't know if you've read that there's a book called Ownership Thinking, but it's really when you start looking at company-wide incentive plans. Yeah, I mean I have 15 employees including myself, right? So it's it's not like it's a massive company. And that's actually pretty small to be able to do 10 million dollars on the top line. But everybody in the company, as small as we are, should should understand how they can help the company be more profitable, right? And so when we set up an incentive plan and say, if we hit this, then then this, this is how it impacts your pocketbook. It's interesting. Organizations behave the way that they're incentivized to behave. And same thing with people, right? So it's, uh, it's yeah, it's about picking the right metrics that are going to drive you to the result that you want and really giving people a reason to celebrate that. I want to share in the success of the company. So yeah, we actually, that's a big piece. I'm finally at the point where we can start to roll out benefits. So we rolled out a 401k in Q1 and two weeks of PTO and, uh, you know, getting quote for medical dental insurance now that, that things have kind of stabilized. Uh, but rolling out a company-wide incentive plan based like we're talking about, that's exactly, that's we're doing that in Q4. Um, and I'm super excited to be at that point and be able to offer that to people. It's uh, You don't see it a lot in, in the short-term rental industry, particularly on the management side. Well, and that's the other thing we do is when you when we roll out a plan, we'll we'll spreadsheet out the whole plan and we'll say, well, what happens at the low end, the mid end, the high end? Because sometimes when I do the high end and they look at that number, there's a lot of business owners, even though they're making a lot of money, who are a little bit queasy writing that check out to yep. people. And I'm like, look, 
if they're helping you make that money, be okay with it. Or let's slightly change the parameters because we can play with all the other parameters you want. The second thing I do, honestly, this has kind of been a, I don't know why, and maybe it's because I came from a corporate background like you did. Your sales comp plan changed every year, didn't it? How you got paid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yet small business owners think that when they write a sales comp plan, they're Moses on top of the mountain chiseling it in stone. I'm like, no, (laughs) you, your comp plan might be 20 K target payout. But the rules of that comp plan can change every single year because you might do something. And they should if you're doing it right. Right. And on top of that, you might do something and realize the market changed, something else changed. And so you got to or you incentivize the wrong thing. So now we got to change it. And the reality is salespeople don't care. They're like, hey, tell me what I need to do and that I'm going to make the money and Life is good. And, and that's definitely, we, our yeah. saying was that's an execution problem. Yeah. So now, now that I run the business, I think I probably approach it a little bit differently. But uh, but our guy that's in charge of sales definitely, definitely thinks like that. Yeah, he'll bring up something. I'm like, well, what about? He's like, that's your problem. <laughs> so yeah, that's, and, that's and definitely that's why it. you have to be careful. Totally. Right? Totally. Now, you started this business. You were in STR, which means you got hit by COVID, right? And, oh, yeah. and the reality is even, even now, I think the STR business is being hit by a whole bunch of parameters from oversupply changes. Like during COVID, everyone wanted to be in the mountains. Now they all want to be at the beach or no one was going to the city. Now they're all going to this. So you're in a in an ever-changing marketplace. How do you deal with how do you a predict the change or notice that change is coming and how do you constantly pivot through these uncertainties yeah it's interesting covid was the worst hospitality recession in the history of mankind right the april of 2020 that should have been the very first month that my management company uh, did a hundred thousand dollars in bookings And we did $767 on a single reservation for emergency responders. It just literally went to zero. And normally, you know, you might have a bad quarter or a bad year in business. You don't go to zero. You go to some percentage of what you were expecting, right? And so, yeah, it was literally zero for a quarter. South Carolina, certainly not as stringent as California or New York or some of the other places where uh, we actually wound up surviving with really what I call MTRs or midterm rentals, kind of the corporate executive rentals you're taking. We took our STRs and as we had interest from some of these other states, we would sign anywhere from four week to four month leases just so that our owner clients could make it through uh, to the other side. Uh, but yeah, it was it was not a fun time for sure. They uh, you, you hear you hear Elon Musk talk about you know being an entrepreneur is like eating glass and chewing glass and staring into the abyss. And uh, COVID was like 10 times worse than that. Uh, So the interesting piece of it, to your point, um, things have massively shifted. We we do operate in Tennessee in the Smokies. Uh, That is a very different market now than it was in 2020. We operate in Asheville in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, same thing. That's that's also very different. And then, you know, urban areas in Charleston and also the beaches. Everything has its ups and downs, just like everything in life. Everything has its ups and downs. One thing that I really like to see in a market is regulation. And that probably sounds a little odd from a guy that manages property in a bunch of different places. But the reality is the more stringent the regulations, the easier it is to stay within those bounds. You know, I go back to my illegal doesn't scale concept. Um, If I have the blueprint and the regulations, I can stay within those. And not only that, but it does tend to cap supply. Because we're in as many different um, cities and counties as we are, there are a couple of places that are um, undergoing class action litigation right now uh, because they're trying to regulate a little bit more effectively. Carlson was kind of ahead of that curve. They they put together a 19-person task force back in 2019, and they left the piece of the market that's very heavily short-term rentals um, the same, the, the regulations the same, uh, but they updated everywhere in and around the city. So it's something that we look at. It matters. The, the reality is uh, state and local municipalities understand that they're losing out on accommodations taxes if they don't regulate properly. Um, and so that's really the reason why they want to lean into it so that they can collect the tax money. Uh, but I mean, that's understandable, right? You would expect that. Um, you would expect that of your your local city councilman or your local mayor. 
to want to regulate that. So yeah, I mean, I, I love the regulation. I think it's huge in terms of what you're talking about, uh, but the trends ha have also massively changed from COVID to your point, people went to the mountains. Now it's more urban areas or overseas. So places that were attractive now in the United States are actually more expensive. It's cheaper to fly over to Europe and enjoy, you know, a week or two week vacation there than it is to go to some places in the U S for a week. So, you know, you see that, that, shift. And then also we've seen a, um, a normalization of rates to pre COVID levels. Um, so, you know, we, we really, we like to look at the data, maybe basically uh, Q4 and then have a thesis for the next year. Um, and then we operate on that thesis. And so, you know, 2023 going into 24, we kind of said more of the same, there's going to be probably another 10 to 15% overall average daily rate pullback. And so we want to stay ahead of that with occupancy and we don't want to be caught um, like some of these managers who don't use dynamic pricing and, and aren't paying attention to the fluctuations post COVID in the market. Um, we want to lead with occupancy a bit. So we're not stuck making those changes to the, into the dirt at the last minute. And sure enough, that's what we have kind of seen all of 2024. So it's all about uh, maximizing return on investment. You know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our owner clients to do so. And the way that you do that changes every single year, just based on how the environment shifts for the markets we operate in. And that's true. I have clients who own STRs. I have clients who are in property management or in the rental business and, and things are constantly changing. And sometimes it's, it's the market. Sometimes it's the, the actual building, like they could be, this building is, and I think that's the one thing, you know, when people are involved in real estate, I think the biggest thing they don't realize, if you don't refresh your properties, like a hotel comes in and does a refresh every what? Yep. I don't even know what their rules are. Seven years, eight years, yep. your property starts looking old. You're going to have a tough time renting. Even if it's a, a long-term rental, you've got to, and, and refresh ain't cheap. Right. If you're not planning for that and understanding that and have the cash set aside for that, you're going to find yourself in That's huge. a world of trouble. So, yeah, it's it's being able to predict all of that, which kind of brings me up to my next question, which is something that I've seen you say. How do you find comfort and discomfort? Because let's face it, as business owners, this is the reality of the situation. We are always going to be in discomfort for something, right? Whether right. it's a headache, employee, cash flow, changes in the marketplace, you know, suppliers, vendors. So. It's always, yeah. I mean, I, I like to say that change, people say embrace change, right? And I, the reason I say embrace discomfort is because change is inevitable, but you can get used, you can get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Right. You can go into that change with a different mindset and use it as a learning opportunity. When, when we roll out, I mean, we're, entrepreneurship is constant problem solving, right? I mean, that's how you continue to scale. You're balancing cash flow with the ability to hire the right teammates, you know, as you're bringing in new clients. It's all uh, kind of one big machine if you're doing it right. And, you know, we really, I expect things to be uncomfortable as quickly as we've grown. We actually paused sales earlier this year for about six months just to uh, kind of stabilize everything, implement some new processes and systems, um, and then you know get ready for another phase of growth. But as I roll out new systems and processes, I never expect a 100% so solution. Um, I feel like if I can get to like 70% on the initial rollout, then the employees and the market are going to tell me and clients are going to tell me if I'm close, right? And then you kind of iterate until you get to that 90, 95% solution. And then at some point that breaks and you've got to do something else anyway. But yeah, I mean, it's change is inevitable. So embracing the discomfort that comes with that inevitable change, uh, to me, that really is one of the keys to success. Um, and it's, that's why I, that's why I like to say that and why it's so important to me. And I know for me that you know, growing my business, I've, I've learned to do that. And plus, I'm always dealing with business owners and I get the phone calls and the text messages when those things happen. And I don't think business owners realize how fast you can go from what you talked about before. We've got all this revenue to revenue stops coming in the door. Yep. And there's a million reasons why. And the markets keep shifting. And that's one of the reasons that we like my first questions are always about what is lead flow because i want to know what is it what is that 
first indicator that something is changing. Yeah. Because if I know early, I can help them pivot. But if I don't know until, you know, three months after the cash didn't come in, yeah. <laughs> we got a, it too late. Totally. Um, totally. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, 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 let me be very clear. I don't want to go through COVID again. <laughs> but when you look at where my business was going into that, you know, and, and for perspective, I said April of 2020 should have been the first month we did $100,000. We do a million dollars a month now, right? So uh, the business is 10x to, over that period of time. And you know, when you look at that, I think it, it makes you operate a little bit differently. Uh, my balance sheet is incredibly clean. I, I finally put a, a fractional CFO across all of my uh, companies you know, do monthly reporting. We look at PL and balance sheet, um, cash flows, right? Like that's all, that's all part of the process, I think. But having been through that, if I do ever have to go through it again, I want to make sure, you know, I, my team is much bigger now too. So I don't, I don't want people to have to worry about their job just because I didn't plan. These people rely on this job for their, you know, their families and their comfort of their own lives. So it's really important to me to take that seriously and make sure that the company lives within its means as well. And you have to live within your means, both personally and in your <laughs> business. Unless you're the government. Unless you're the government, yeah. <laughs> you, they you have the power more. to show up and take. <laughs> You've also started giving back, right? You started a nonprofit around the short-term rental space. Can you tell us a little sure. about it? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. It's, uh, so it's Keys Collective. Keys is actually an acronym for Knowledge to Evolve Your Success. Uh, you mentioned Eric earlier. It's something that he and I have kind of been working on. I really just hit a point where I was tired post COVID of seeing these uh, some of these folks post on Instagram. You know, these Instagram stories and reels and uh, and YouTube uh, videos about how they took you know, one property did rental arbitrage post COVID and they made all this money and now they sit on a beach and manage their 50 properties while they're sipping a Mai Tai. You know, it really, I think it started to bother me and I, I started to realize I probably had something to say. You know, those people, anybody, if you were doing rental arbitrage going into COVID, you probably aren't in business anymore, right? So, you know, timing is a lot of life and there's not a whole lot we can do to control the, that timing. We just have to be smart enough to recognize it when it slaps us in the face. And so I've been able to have some success. I, I had actually informally started this, this mentor program, basically kind of like GoBundance, except very specifically centered around um, short-term rentals and boutique hotels. That's the asset class that the majority of my net worth is invested in. Um, it's certainly the asset class that I would consider myself a subject matter expert in. And so I've, I've built a team of mentors you know, anything from a 1031 tax exchange person to a virtual assistant CEO, if people need VAs, my CFO that's helped me out uh, so I can actually sleep better at night. Person that has sold a rental arbitrage business all the way to a guy that has gone from zero to 300 listings under management and bought seven companies in the last two years and raised millions of dollars of venture capital to do a property management company roll up and everything in between. I really started to look at like, okay, coming into this, what would it have been nice to know? Um, and then really mapped out and said, okay, now who do I know that would be like the best expert I can think of um, that I wish I would have had access to when I started 12 years ago? Um, and that's how we've set it up. So uh, we've got about 14 mentors um, signed up uh, in the program and uh, just rolled out the first uh, cohort here. So uh, yeah, Keys Collective, we set it up as a nonprofit. Um, and really, there are short-term rental masterminds. The big thing for me is I don't expect this to, if it, if it pays for itself, that's great. I don't expect it to be a big piece of my income. I would rather donate to you know, housing-related nonprofits, um, you know, affordable housing-related nonprofits with any uh, profits that come from this, uh, than actually take a paycheck from it. Uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to be in the position that I don't need it. And I think this is actually a piece setting it up as a nonprofit that makes us unique and a little bit different from some of the other short-term rental and boutique hotel masterminds that are out there. Nice. And thank you for giving. If people would like to learn more about you, about your companies, about the nonprofit, what's the best way to do that? Sure. Either my personal website is joshhatter.com. So just like the, the name shows up on the screen, just josh, joshhatter.com. Keys Collective is just keyscollective.com. Org. Uh, there's actually a, a link to apply on there and that goes directly to our membership chair um, who will promptly call somebody and you know go through the application of why they're interested and uh, come back to the board with it. So 
keyscollective.org, joshhatter.com. Would love to hear from folks. Cool. We'll put that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, Rocky. Thanks for listening to this unedited video of the Profit Answer Man podcast. If you'd like to catch the full episode and learn more about what we do, check us out at profitcomesfirst.com. We also go through the Profit First book in each and every chapter in the beginning episodes of the podcast, so check those out as well. Thanks for listening, and here's to you having a more profitable and growing business.